Last July, Tony and I brought a team of archaeologists to the Scottish Highlands to investigate the Battle of Culloden. <laughs> Today, the site of the battle is a popular tourist attraction, visited by 250,000 peaceful people a year. But just 250 years ago, 14,000 men lined up here in anger and fought the last ever pitched battle to take place on British soil. Let's go! It was a fantastic opportunity to be allowed to undertake archaeological work on such an important battlefield. So we established camp, ready to get started tomorrow morning. We need time to settle in. It's always very traumatic moving, you know. I'm lying down now. See you later. See you later. See you later. See you later. The Battle of Culloden illuminates a dynastic rivalry of gigantic proportions. In 1745, Bonnie Prince Charles stepped into the spotlight. He sailed out of exile, landed on Scottish soil, and, along with his Jacobite supporters, attempted to restore his father and the Stuart line to the British throne, which they'd been kicked off 57 years before. His cousin, William, Duke of Cumberland, the youngest son of King George II, led a huge government army against him. On April 16th, 1746, they met just outside Inverness on Culloden Moor in a battle whose aftermath would reverberate down through the centuries. Some amount of tourists visit this place every day. I love it here. I've been coming here all my life. My father used to bring me here when I was, like, but a boy. The thing is, like, it's, an, it's, a, it's a tourist attraction on the day of the battle itself. Well, I'd have come to see it. Yeah. What else are you going to do? How many times do you get to go and see a battle? Not often. And then, Not and then, until Rangers play Celtic, anyway. Little did they know as well that it was going to turn out to be the last pitched battle ever fought on British soil. Imagine bought the T-shirt and the program for that. Oh, the, the souvenir value! Fantastic. It's through the roof, man. Lovely morning. When I say that in Scotland, Neil, I mean it's not raining. Yeah, obviously. The battlefield is now owned and run by the National Trust for Scotland. It's a difficult job requiring great sensitivity because Culloden is seen as a watershed in Scottish history and even now still arouses great passions. With the rest of our team, we were going to do archaeological battle with some of the myths and traditions that have grown up around Culloden and its aftermath. Looking quite chipper. How's the night's sleep? It was not bad. Had worse. Apart from the battlefield itself, we were also going to investigate the site of a farmstead called Old Lennox that found itself caught up in the battle. Conveniently placed right next to our tent, this is where we were going to begin. Right, so we've got a building here which we believe or told was, was here on, on the day of the battle. Um, but obviously on the ground here we've got all these lumps and bumps and we've got these aligned stones. It's quite a nice solid line coming up through here and almost a corner arcing around under there. So what that might represent, we don't know. We know, we know from the early maps that there are supposed to be three buildings. Yeah. So what we're going to try and do is locate the missing buildings. Now, we've done some geophysics in the area and we think we've got something running that way a long rectangular structure, buried walls under the ground. So if we put in maybe a metre wide trench running right the way down from where Neil is, right down to here, and then if that is an interior area, what we want to do is really open up as much as we can. Yeah. You're going to have to come and do this. It's too hard for me, <laughs> old son. Tony can be a bit slack sometimes. <laughs> it's hard bloody work. <laughs> We're particularly interested in one of the buildings associated with Old Lennox, the so-called Red Barn, 
because it was in that building that one of the alleged atrocities of the Culloden battle is said to have taken place. According to the often told story, the building was set on fire and burned to the ground while it was full of Jacobite soldiers who were being treated for their wounds. So we'll be approaching this site uh, as forensic scientists. We'll treat it like a crime scene and we'll see if, we can, if there are any burnt remains to be found here. We're also interested in this building here. This is supposed to have been standing at the time and indeed part of the farmstead of Old Lennox, and that's an idea we're hoping through the excavation to prove or disprove. But before we do that, we've got to do a bit more digging. Yeah, you're not wrong. Imagining ourselves as a latter-day Holmes and Watson, we pressed on with the painstaking investigation into the mystery of Old Lennox and the infamous Red Barn. Paul, how goes it in the trenches? Seems to be going well, Tony. Is that geophysical thing matching up with, with what, we're, what we're getting over there? It looks like they've got it bang on the button. Uh, the anomaly that we picked up in the geophysics that shows the, the building that appears to be running underneath So it goes it running sort of that way under, an, under the building yeah. at an angle? Yeah, it's spot on. So that rubble spread there, which is giving a nice angled line coming along there, this could actually be the back wall. Yeah, and it matches up possibly with the rest of that so if, big if, long thing. If you look at it there. that way, this jumbled mound actually starts to make sense because you can see, the, see it continuing. So we may have the other corner here. Exactly. With the wall yeah. running that way. Yeah. We're also getting hints, and I only say hints, of burning turning up in so some of these areas as well. So you got a lot of charcoal well. coming up. Got a lot of charcoal. We've got big bits of round wood, wow. which appear to be burnt as well. Uh, enough scrap metal to probably by a paint each. <laughs> so this could be really important, because this is supposedly, according to the National Trust for Scotland, this is supposedly the Red Barn, where they burnt those Jacobite wounded soldiers after the battle. Yeah. So if we're looking for a burnt building, what we're going to expect is lots of charcoal, where the crook beams inside and the turf thatch roof has fallen in. I mean, we might still be a bit high here, because yeah. we're still not down onto the original floor surface, are we? That's excellent. Good job. No court in the land would convict on the evidence we had so far. There was still a long way to go. The man in the dock charged with the Red Barn massacre and countless other atrocities at Culloden is still known to this day by his accusers as the Butcher. William, Duke of Cumberland, was the youngest son of King George II, and he's a truly larger-than-life character. Always a chubby child, he was no stranger to the sticky bun factory in adult life either. And by the time he meets up with his cousin, Bonnie Prince Charlie, on the field at Culloden, he's newly 25 years old and a high and mighty 18 stone. If Bonnie Prince Charlie is a ladies' man, Cumberland is a man's man. He's fond of boxing and horse racing. He's very popular with his men. They know him as a harsh disciplinarian and they also know that he can be brutal in the face of the enemy. He's battle trained and battle scarred. At the Battle of Dettingen in Germany, he suffers a wound to the thigh caused by a musket ball, so he knows the kind of thing that's likely to happen to him on a battlefield. The government army that he commands has 6,400 foot soldiers and 2,400 mounted men. At Culloden, he's a commander at the top of his game. But did he order the massacre of the Red Barn? The archaeological evidence was ready to put before the court. Have you solved the mystery of the Red Barn? Well... Um, we're still getting the patches of charcoal coming up. Yeah. Stuff that we thought might be associated with the burning of the cottage to start with. But um, it doesn't actually look like we have the burning layer underneath. Is it, is it starting that. to spread out at all? No. In fact, quite the reverse, Tony. It's starting to, to disappear the further down we get. Our hopes of finding the Red Barn dashed. We now wanted to discover whether this really was the site of the Lennox farmstead. I mean, Annette's trench over here, which is feverishly scraping away at. <coughs> We started excavating this <coughs> at the very, in fact, at the very top of this, which got us a bit excited. We got a little coin. Really? Yeah. It's got a date of 1904. 1904. It. It's a silver three three penny piece. I mean, if we're looking for something related to 1746, you know, there is every every possibility it could could be underneath. Well, I'm oh, sorry to dash that hope as well, but as we've started digging down, Annette's just come on to. Again, what looks like a glacial subsoil. So that's a, a glacial sub... That's not a nice clay floor we're looking at there. No, unfortunately, it's not a nice clay floor. We've had s several bits of pottery from the layers above, but... It all looks a bit burnt. Somebody's lunch. Yeah. Unfortunately, not quite what we're looking for, I that's, guess. That's 19th century stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Like domestic. If the material coming out of it is 19th century, and that's lying immediately on top of that undisturbed, clean, natural, 
It doesn't go back beyond the 19th century. It doesn't. By at the moment, you're inference. not seeing anything going back any further. No. And certainly not as far back as 17. Certainly not back as far back as Bonnie Prince Charlie's time. Given that this has been, well, for the longest time identified and treated as the Lennox farmsteading on the basis of that building, it's going to be very significant if, in fact, we can show that there was activity here in the 19th century, but it wasn't what, the Lennox farmstead. It's going to ruffle a few feathers. Right, that's a I'll leave you to it then. We were now confident that the cottage previously thought to be part of Old Lennox was, in fact, built much later in the mid-Victorian period. Our excavation had uncovered its walled garden and the place where the charcoal embers from its hearth were dumped. The main witness in the trial against the Duke of Cumberland, the Red Barn, was unavailable to testify, so the verdict would have to be, case not proven. Tomorrow, we were moving our archaeological detectives onto the battlefield. You ever worn a kilt, Neil? No, oh, I. Several times. Are they warm? <clears throat> They're roasty toasty, because generally in this day and age you tend to find yourself in a kilt in a wedding reception, dancing. It yeah. tends to be a bit warm. But the real plaid the is, not a, is not no, a wee tartan yeah. skirt. You know, there was regional variations in the colours. At the, t at the time of the battle? At the time of the battle. Yeah. But there was nothing like, if you're a Fraser, you wear yeah. this design, and if you're a Macintosh, you wear that design. That was the Victorians, wasn't it? Romanticising the Highlands. Imagine if Scotland was really like that. Imagine if, imagine if we were all cutting about in knee-high white socks and little tartan kilts. And, and those shirts with the puffy cuffs and the laces. I think that would be great. you get postmen and binmen and stuff. Long distance lorry drivers. Mind you, I think I'll just go out and buy some Gore-Tex. Look at the state of the weather out there. Thank God for the tent on a night like this, eh? Yeah. Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobite army had so far had a spectacularly successful military campaign. In six months, they'd never lost a battle. At one point, they even managed to advance right into the heart of England, as far south as Derby, before retreating back to the Highlands to regroup. Now, they face their stiffest test in the shape of Charlie's cousin, the Duke of Cumberland, at the head of 9,000 well-trained, well-armed and well-fed troops, all of whom were coming their way. Four days before the battle, Cumberland and his soldiers had reached their last major obstacle before they could finally close with the Jacobite army, the treacherous River Spee. You belted in? I am. We were off to find out just how difficult it would have been to cross. Well, I really put my foot down and see if this baby will go to 45. I think it might shake something loose. Hey, look, check these out. I didn't realise they dumped Roy Orbison's body in Spain. <laughs> Is that all that remains of him? Oh. Right. This is good, eh? Archaeology in the raw. 9,000 men across there without the aid of a bridge. Yeah. Not a bad day's work. Because it would only be a sentence in a book, wouldn't it? it they would. crossed the Spey. Well... But look at it. The other sentence is, a dragoon and four women drowned. Yeah. 2,000 of Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobites were over there somewhere. That's the thing that would have put the edge on it, isn't it? I mean, had the Jacobites decided to wait for them yeah. and spring an attack as they crossed the river, yeah. I would imagine they would be in a grave danger. Right, so 9,000 men. Here we go. 9,000 men. Look like a crowd. Oh. I don't feel quite so intrepid now. Hang on, hang on. If you're going down, don't grab for me. <laughs> I'll notify your significant others. And it's not that the Duke's army was an English army either. In fact, there were more Scots fighting for the Duke than fought for Charlie. Really? Yeah. But imagine having to do all this with all that kit they must have been carrying, the muskets and stuff. And... Hey, it's a heck of a current. Oof. I'm not happy, Harry. <laughs> it's getting a bit... It's getting considerably deeper now. It's getting considerably swifter, too. It's over the top of a waders, Neil! <laughs> it's over the top! <laughs> I'm taking in water! <laughs> Engine rooms are flooded! <laughs> Get me out! I'm leaving! Oh. 
I'm going on alone. My left leg weighs about six tons. <laughs> <laughs> Cumberland's troops were exposed and vulnerable as they crossed the river, but the Jacobites didn't attack. Safely on the other bank, the government soldiers were now free to advance to Nairn, their last stop before the battle. It was here that Cumberland spent his 25th birthday, toasted by his men who'd been given a special ration of brandy to celebrate. We were intent on tracking down the room where he'd slept that night. Local folk around here call it the Duke's bedroom, apparently. We'd heard a rumour it was on the high street, just above a charity shop. Lead on, Macduff. We're looking for Bane. This is Bane. I offer you. Right, ring the bell. I'll run away. There's different names on the bell. Hello? Hello, who's there? If you want oh, me... Oh, hello? To... Take him upstairs if you want. Is that her? Is that Mrs. Oh. Bane? Yes. Oh, hello. Oh, coming up. Hello. Hello. How do you do? I'm Neil. Uh, oh, pleased to meet you. Hello, I'm Tony. Right, Tony. Hello, pleased, pleased to, to meet, meet you. you. How are you? What are you after? We're dead keen to get a look at uh, the Duke's bedroom. I've read about it, but I've never seen it. Are you all going to? Would you all like to see it? It's not many people call to see it, but I'll let really? you Really? Don't, you don't get anybody coming to ask to well, see it? Well, some people ask, but they don't always get. <laughs> That's the way of it, isn't it? But some will be very well behaved well. and quiet. <laughs> Have you got any ghosts? No, thank goodness for that. <laughs> wow. Jack. Check that out. Could we take some pictures? Yeah. Would that be all right? Take some snaps? Yeah, I suppose so, if you can manage. There's such a lot of stuff in it. Oh, wow. <sighs> Seemingly hasn't been altered. Really? Is this the original panelling? Yes. Yes. Pitch pine, it's supposed to be. Pitch pine. It's got some layers of paint on it, hasn't it? Yes, well. This is where he spent the night. This is where he spent the, the night, yes. I wonder how much sleep he got. I don't know, didn't deserve very much Big anyway. day ahead. No, no, I don't think I'd have got much. So you're not his greatest fan? No. <laughs> very polite answer. I'd have preferred Prince Charles to have slept here. It does have a, a certain atmosphere, it has to be said. It's the fact it's so small. Very atmospheric. Fantastic. Here. Thank you for your time, Mrs. Blaine. Pardon? Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. If you'd know you'd come and I'd beat the key. <laughs> <laughs> I love Mrs. Blaine. I know. I'm damn sure I wouldn't let a couple of no marks like us around my house. <laughs> Whilst the government army celebrated, Charlie attempted to spoil the party by crashing it. Under the cover of darkness, his army set off to Nairn, but the going was slow and after six hours, with dawn beginning to break, the element of surprise was lost, and they turned back to Culloden Moor. Tired and hungry, with the government soldiers hot on their heels, now more than ever they needed inspiration from their leader. Charles Edward Stuart, the Bonnie Prince Charlie, was born into exile in Rome on New Year's Eve in 1720, and he's surrounded all the time by Jacobite lackeys, who tell him that it's his right and his duty and his destiny to put a Stuart monarch back on the British throne. He also knows that the story of the Stuarts is one that's not without tragedy and disaster. James IV, the Stuart King, died in battle. Charles's own great-grandfather, Charles I, was beheaded at the end of the English Civil War. His grandfather, James II, was deposed and driven into exile, and his own father never ruled. And so Charles grows to manhood with this feeling that there is a historical wrong here and that he is the man to put it right once and for all. And when he turns up in Britain in the summer of 45, he has only a handful of supporters, and he lands at Eriske in the Hebrides. And to begin with, things get off to less than a flying start because the local chiefs say, go home. Give us peace, we don't need your kind of trouble here. But Charlie says, I am come home and I will not return to France for I am persuaded that my faithful Highlanders will stay with me. And so it is and so they do. Donald Cameron of Lachiel promises all of his fighting men and all of his financial support to the Prince's cause. Others of the clan chiefs are more pragmatic. They send one son to fight for Charlie, but they send another son to fight for George II so that however things turn out, their estates are going to be secure. And it's here on Culloden Moor, 
on April the 16th, 1746, that things begin to draw to their conclusion. And for the first time, Charlie takes battlefield command. Previously, he has always left the tactics and the strategy to more experienced soldiers in his command, but now he decides that he will run this show. And he does this because, after all, it's his destiny. And perhaps he feels that if he's to be entitled to that destiny and to put the Stuarts back on the British throne, he has to fight for it himself. The Battle of Culloden began at around one o'clock in the afternoon when Bonnie Prince Charlie's artillery opened fire. The government gunners responded. They were better armed and better trained and soon silenced the opposition. Their aim was then switched to the Jacobite infantry, who were now forced to raise their battle cry, Claim or! and launch the ferocious Highland charge. Cumberland's cannons and muskets replied with a devastating hail of lead. It said that the government soldiers hardly took their firelocks from their shoulders. As the Highland charge tore across the moor through the wind and sleet, it lost its form and cohesion. The left flank stalled, but the rest, which had bunched together, was more successful and managed to smash into the regiments of Barrel and Monroe on the government line. The outcome of a battle is influenced by many factors, but one of the most important is location, location, location. No detailed map of the battlefield exists, so in order to be able to understand all the subtle changes in the landscape, we had to make our own. It was down to John, our surveyor, his theodolite, me, and a lot of legwork. Put the staff down there, Tony, and we'll see if we can see you. OK. OK, got that one. To us, the ground here is vital because it's over this ground that the Jacobite army charged on the day of the battle. They had this, this great weapon renowned as the Highland Charge, and it was a very basic thing. What happened was the entire Jacobite line would hurtle toward the government army in a huge shockwave, and then the idea was that they'd break over them, break into them, and destroy the discipline and the morale. But on the day, that didn't work. And we think in order to understand why that disaster happened for the Jacobites, we need to be able to see very clearly what's happening on the ground, and that's why we're doing the survey here. I wanted to find out about the soldiers who, by dint of their ferocious courage, would charge a line of government muskets. So I was off to meet Alan McInnes of Aberdeen University. What was the makeup of the Jacobite army? Well, I think maybe we should say at the outset, the Jacobite Rising was a civil war in Scotland. So it drew support from all over in every area of Scotland, but the predominant numbers who fought for the, uh, the cause at Culloden were uh, clansmen in the first rank, followed by people from the northeast of Scotland mainly uh, in the second rank. And the third is also a professional element that comes back through Irish and Scottish brigades and French service. Uh, who come back to give a professional backbone to this whole army. How did the clan system operate? Well, it, it's not sort of a static system. It had been changing hugely. It had started off in the sort of maybe called the High Middle Ages, when you would have a powerful lord who would offer protection in return for allegiance. By the time of Culloden, that's, that style of society was being phased out, but it still had a military capacity. So you could, by putting around a fiery cross, you could mobilise thousands of men. How well trained were the clansmen in the front ranks? I think it can be overstated. It's easy to mobilise the clans for military reasons, but people were less used to war. Things like clan feuds had died out by the 1680s, or the last one was in 1688. Cattle rustling on a large scale had long gone. It was only small groups who did this. But if they are properly trained and you have a good general, in the case of the Jacobites, they hired Lord George Murray, and they also had the Drummonds, and with a military corps there from the Irish and Scottish brigades, you could have a, a formidable fighting force. We've finished the topographic survey and it's come up with some quite staggering results. What we've actually discovered is there's a spine of higher ground which runs through the middle of the battlefield. We're just stood behind where the Jacobite army was lined up and it runs through the centre of the Jacobite army and the ground on that side of the spine 
slopes down quite dramatically. But on this side, as you can see quite clearly here, it comes down quite gently and is quite flat. And the Highland Charge depended on breaking like a continuous wave for its success. So it's that total concussion that breaks the enemy. But on the day, during the battle, the Jacobite line broke up. And for the first time, we think we understand why that happens. The centre of the line gets, surges forward first, followed by the right, and they actually get as far as the government line. They get to bayonet point. And that's because both are following the contours, they're following the path of least resistance. So it's creating a sort of funnel effect. Whereas here, on the left-hand end of the, the Jacobite army, you've got this open ground. These guys didn't get nearly as close to the enemy as the others. And you can see exactly why, because there's so much open ground, the government troops had a clear line of fire all the way along. So the poor McDonald's on this side of the, of the army didn't stand a chance. They were given the worst terrain, and they were just cut to pieces. But the guys on the right, they just get right in, and it's, it's not because they're braver or more determined, it's because they're being channeled in and they're being covered by the ground that they're charging over. So it's amazing, it's a simple case of here, topography rewriting history. How did the government soldiers stand up to the terrifying Highland Charge once it hit them? I fetched Andy Robertshaw from the National Army Museum to instruct us in the benefits of discipline. Hello, Andy. Hello. Welcome to sunny Scotland. <laughs> I love it when you get the laundry back. Yeah. <laughs> what I've got then is two sets of clothing. Uh, Neil, your stand Jacobite. Uh -huh. Tony, you've got a set of uh, government uniforms put on. Tony, look, kit and heels. Lovely. Check these out, Neil. Oh, lovely. Look at the flappage. Are we called scuttle door? <laughs> nice legs, Neil. I have always thought so. OK. There's an awful lot of stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look lovely, Neil. Actually. Will you go out with me? <laughs> Yeah. Nice bustle you've got at the back there, Neil. Is my bum look big in this? <laughs> you've seen a bunch of hairy ass Scots <laughs> waving swords about. That's fine. Good. Oh, yeah. Because you two are roughly the same social rank, which is good. What? What? Okay. Is, what's all this? That's the, 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 basically what you've got is a series of uh, aguilettes, as they're called, and they're basically show anybody that you're an officer. Well, it's pretty clear who you are anyway, because there you've got then the uh, black government army cockade, and then you've got the Jacobite one, which is white. Absolutely. Um, should we look at weapons then? Oh yes, please. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's start then with. Uh, I'm ready to go, Neil. If we give you um, that to begin with, which is your claymore. I like the okay, over that shoulder, left arm. Left arm. Right? Left arm. Over it goes. Your musket. Oh, there we yeah, go. Yeah. Or firelock, fusil, call it what you like. Sometimes called the brown vest today. Brown and then that comes with uh, the bayonet, which means that that can then go on the end off to one side. That's a nice. Ready to go into action. I feel better now. Absolutely. Feeling a bit more confident now, Neil. So uh, now we're uh, there. Shall I demonstrate how these um, would work? Oh yes, please. I think the best place to go is down in the paddock where Barrel's position is on the left left end of the government army. I think it's the only place to go, isn't it? That's where the Jacobites hit. Right. Right. This way. How do you feel? Great man. Is it all right? Great man. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you swagger. Of course. Is that what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> This is where it's all supposed to have happened. Right, so where are we in relationship to the, the battle itself? We're on the left end of the government army. Right. They're all lined up along the yellow flags here. Yeah. You've got the Jacobite army lined up facing them almost, but at a slight angle, about 300 metres that way. Yeah. They're marked out with a row of red flags. You can't see those because of these trees. And Barrel's regiment's supposed to be about here on the, on the far left. Yeah. OK, Neil, you're one of the Jacobites attacking. What's your tactic as you approach? I, I know you may have had a carbine or a musket. Mm. You've fired that on the way in, you've thrown it away. What happens next? Well, I'm part of the Highland Charge. Yes. So there's a mob of me and my brothers coming at them. Yeah. Right. Sisters. Brothers, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm just getting into, into period, you know. And what I'm going to do is I want to open him up so that I can get in at him with, with my sharp stuff. And how do you do that? Well, I want to barge anything he's got out of the way yeah. with my shield. Yeah. So I knock that down, hopefully knock him off balance and cleave him from from head to toe. Yeah, I mean from one of the to waist. We have, well, one of the soldiers on this side, one of the, the government officers actually ran his opponent through with a pike 
a spontoon, couldn't get it out and was cut to bits. Yeah. And that one of these hit him on the head and it went straight through, through the hat, through his head and stopped on the breastbone. So that gives you some idea what it could do. That's a successful attack. OK, so we, we've looked at how you'd attack, mm -hmm. so let's see how you defend against it. Well, for about six weeks before the battle, the government army had been practising a new tactic. As we're going to be standing two deep or three deep line to deal with the attack, is that we're going to really rely on each other. So I'm going to be actually dealing with a situation where if you're attacking me head on, all right, I don't really fancy this, I'm not armed, what will happen is that I don't deal with you and you don't deal with the man in front of you. Instead, you turn quarter to your right, which right. means that when you lift your arm up... So you're ignoring you're, me. I'm, I'm actually ignoring you. I'm dealing with the guy here, but and he I... is dealing with you. Your Taj can knock my bayonet out of the way. I don't mind too much, because I know my left-hand man is going to oh, get you. Man, That's you. exactly what's going to happen. Now, it probably didn't work that perfectly, because they won't all arrive at the same time, all neatly lined up, but you've been trained. It will work. You will defeat your opponents. The other thing that was probably happening is that the front rank was holding the enemy like you are now with the bayonets back and the second two ranks behind you can fire over the top. Oh. So what you've actually got is a hedge of bayonets. You're approaching, you can't go in, you're milling around. So what's happening from Barrels and Monroe's regiment is literally holding you. You can't break through and once you're stopped, that's it for the battle. Yeah. It's really a one-trick pony, the Highland Absolutely. Challenge. Absolutely. If it works, it's brilliant, but if not, you can, can do nothing else with it. In all the previous battles, as soon as the enemy broke a regiment, it ran and you just slaughtered them. A lot of running away by you boys. But not on this occasion. Not on this one. Only takes one. Absolutely. Third time, lucky. You, well, unlucky in this case, depending if you're a Jacobite or not. So, do you want to settle it? Well, I think like the gentlemen were obviously dressed up to be, we should go and settle it over tea. Well, I think that's very civilised, don't you? I'll get my servant to put the kettle on. <laughs> Come <laughs> back to my camp, sir. Shall I be mother? <laughs> Let's get busy now. This place is constantly busy. It was make or break time, and Bonnie Prince Charlie threw everything he had into the battle. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat raged where the Highland Charge had met the government line, but the determined regiments of Barrel and Monroe managed to hold them. Then the tide began to turn. It was said that after the battle there was not one bayonet in Barrel's regiment that was not bloodied or bent. Right guys, so what we're going to do, we're going to use the tapes and the coloured arrows and we're going to set out a couple of grids. We wanted to identify on the ground where this crucial clash had taken place. Find the evidence of close combat, the ammunition, armaments and personal effects. So we recruited some Highland metal detectorists and set out amongst the tourists. This is National Trust for Scotland property and metal detectors are totally banned as they are on all protected schedule monuments um, in the country. And to get permission to come in is, is really quite amazing. But we've had, to, we've had to put across the fact that there is a rigorous research design that we're working to. We're answering specific archaeologically valid questions. The, the finds that we will hopefully make here will fill in important gaps in our understanding of the battle. I'm so excited. <laughs> ah. Ah, uh, dear, oh dear. What is that? It's a badge. <laughs> it's not come off a Jacobite's hat, has it? <laughs> oh, it's a commemorative badge, 1745 to 46. <laughs> it is a white cockade. Oh, it's a white cockade. That's what happens when your battlefield becomes a tourist site, I suppose. Exactly. <laughs> I'll flip that over. After spending hours in the area in front of the visitor's centre, we weren't having any luck at all. Then, from over the fence next door, we got a call. You got a find? What you got? A musket ball. Really? Oh. Oh. Man, oh, you shall go to the ball. Show, show, show. Oh, wow. Perfect. Solid ball of lead. The last time anybody was handling that, it was being stuck down a musket. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly didn't hit anything. No. Helen? Musket ball. Oh. Hold out your hand. Nice. Hold out your hand. Out of that molehill, on the surface. Dead weight. Oh. Was it just lying on top? Yeah. My mole had just thrown it up while well, it was tunnelling. Fantastic. Archaeologists nil, moles won. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Yes! <laughs> oh, you're dancing. So what is it? Wow. Oh, fantastic. And again, in pristine condition. <laughs> your beauty. Oh, maybe we're on a roll now. Maybe we've cracked it. 
Right. Oh, I love it when a plan comes together. Do the plug, do the plug. <coughs> oh, what's that? Oh, sweet! Oh! Oh! <laughs> Grape shot! Grape shot! <laughs> Flat as a oh, That's the yeah, only place in Scotland you're going to get grape shot is here because it was never fired anywhere else. Was that flat? In the Highlands. Man? It's hit something. Oh. That is incredible, isn't it? Look at it. That was fired by the government artillery into the oncoming Jacobite line. When the Jacobites were standing preparing to charge, they were firing solid balls at them, which were about this big. And they were bouncing off the ground in front of the line and going through six, seven men at a time. But as they charged, they changed over to this stuff. And it's like, if you like, a huge shotgun. And 40-odd of these come out at the same time in a canister, which hits the ground and breaks open on the ground. So these go spraying into the face of the oncoming troops. Absolutely devastating. And that's hit something. That, that would have counted for huge amounts of the Jacobite casualties. So what we're looking at is, a, if you like, a freeze frame of the Jacobite line, just as they're hurtling forward, this is where they received at least one volley. So guys would have died just here. You know, that's a gruesome thought. It's a gruesome fact that we are... This is, this is the battle. This is it unfolding here. As the Highland charge was being halted in its tracks, the decisive blow of the battle was struck by government dragoons and the Campbell militia. They'd managed to break through the stone walls that protected the rear of the Jacobite army and then attack. Almost encircled, it was now only a matter of time for Bonnie Prince Charlie and his men. This was the area we were looking for in the second part of our metal detector survey. Oh, what's that musical noise? Oh, now that is a seriously damaged musket ball. Look at it. It's got striations on it where it's hit. Oh. And that's not just fallen to the ground after being fired, fired high. That's hit something at velocity. Well, that's grim. They've suddenly got men and horses bearing down on them and they're taking hits. Another one. Yeah, that one's a bit distorted, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it just looks like a pebble. These have seen action. I mean, this is blood and gore without the blood and gore. What we're seeing here is the killer blow, the coup de grace. This is where the battle was lost. Yeah. Though we're... Though we've talked about the huge losses in the charge and in the, in the, at the point where the Jacobites charged into the government line, this is actually where the, the battle was physically lost yeah. because here they'd been outmaneuvered and outgunned. And by the there time... was nothing they could do. They got the enemy to the front and the enemy to the rear now, and that was it. The game, the game was over. The battle had lasted less than an hour. The Jacobite cause was lying cut to pieces on Culloden Moor. Bonnie Prince Charlie had fled and after managing to evade the largest manhunt ever mounted in Britain, he eventually escaped into exile on the continent. Before Andy disappeared, we got him to give some of our finds the once-over. Tony and I have been spending quality time with the metal detectorists, and uh, we're really pleased with the stuff we've got. This is some of our favourites. Ooh. Um, I've handled one of these when I was um, uh, making muskets, and I know exactly what it is. Can you get, get the, the musket from over there? Have a look. Well, there we have it. If you give it here, um, turn it on its side. This obviously is a, a, a replica, mm -hmm. and it's not quite right because there should be this distinctive shape at the end of this bit of trigger guard. Oh. And in fact, there shouldn't be two screw holes in it. There should be one screw hole and a pin that goes through the stock that holds that in place, which means that that screw hole is exactly right but something has snapped it off at that point there mm -hmm. and that would take a hell of a lot when you think it's fastened to yeah. a wooden stock it's not tin foil is it that's absolutely the only reason that you use weapons is because somebody's hit that they, 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 they fall on the ground the weapons lost or the weapon is damaged in some way and this is consistent with that happening you don't just at the end of the battle scatter bits of gun around for no apparent yeah. reason next this is a strange little thing Ooh. Not so strange. Can we have the musket back again? Um, if we have a look at it, this one is a replica, and that ramrod is metal. The period we're talking about, 1740s, ramrods are, are wooden, and as they're wooden, they're much bigger to make them rigid. Mm -hmm. And that is that the right diameter. It is the right diameter, no doubt, for a wooden ramrod of the period. Mm. And in fact, this is obviously not the right one, that isn't the right one, but that one in the middle is exactly right for being what the ramrod would go through. But, you know, you've got a musket not found after the battle or badly damaged and they've just left part of it. Things are getting pretty hot. If 
Well, it, well are getting smashed up. It's we? something's happening there, isn't there? And it, that's it's not just people, you know, forgetting them and putting them down. No, this is nice. This is really nice. Really lovely. It's gonna blow away in the wind, actually. Oh, yes. I'll drop it in the tea. Let's take a little um, silver. It is silver, isn't it? It is silver. Yeah. Let's take a little silver leaf. Um, I think I know what this is, and it's not a leaf. In the 17th century, when they established in the army grenadiers, they armed them with a grenade, a metal sphere, hollow, full of gunpowder, with a fuse in it. And when you lit the fuse and you threw it, you got a flame out of it. And later on, when every regiment had a company of grenadiers, they had their own distinctive badge, which was a sphere with a flame over it. Mm. And that's a little flame, exactly the same as you find on the back of grenadier caps. Because they wear a distinctive mitre cap, and I've got some in the army museum. We've got these, and they, they, it sits at the back of the, the head, and they're normally just embroidered uh, with wool. But if you're an officer, I've seen them in, in silver embroidery, I've never seen them solid. So that could be a one-off, something that someone with a bit of money has had commissioned. Yeah. The officers would get their own uh, caps made, so this right. may be something unique to one man. Beauty. OK. And last but not least, we have... Beautiful beauty. This is very fragile. It's mm. made of iron. Oh, yeah. It's quite badly corroded. Ooh, it's awfully nail like, but it's too it's fine, isn't it? It's not a nail. No, it's, it's too fine. I think that's a pin, isn't it? Yeah. From something like a plaid. Well, that's that's exactly what we were thinking, because that's right where the Jacobite army. Because that's going to be worn up here, isn't right it? Yeah. Here. In fact, there's, there's not very much value to that. It's only made of iron, but but perhaps the only bit of iron that that guy would be wearing. So valuable to a poor man. Absolutely, it's something that was left over after the battle. I mean, you know, whether the guy w was wounded or killed, he, he lost that. Yeah. Fantastic, really. Right, we'll get all this stuff down the flea market, get a few quid and go to the pub. <laughs> As well as identifying the areas where specific events of the battle took place, our metal detector survey had also shown that the battlefield was bigger than has been traditionally thought. In the last part of our work into the Battle of Culloden, we'd be looking for the graves of the men who fought and died here. Amongst them were ancestors of mine, on my mother's side, supposedly buried in the clan cemetery. Oh, no way. Come on. It's another day for you and me in paradise. Oh, Neil, give it a break, will you? God, it's like raising the dead. Culloden Moor is the final resting place for up to one and a half thousand Jacobites and between two to four hundred government soldiers. Before now, no archaeological work has ever been undertaken into the graves of these troops. But after long and complicated negotiations, we'd been granted permission to bring in our team and investigate. In many ways, this whole battlefield of Culloden is one great big war memorial. And here in the, the cemetery for the clans, the clan graves, is the centre, the focus for all that mourning. But what we're interested in finding out is just how real it is, because it's not all as it seems. When I came here as a kid, in the, in the 1970s, there was a road running right through here and Tony and I are standing right in the middle of what was that road. Uh, also at that time, there was uh, a forestry plantation here, the Forestry Commission had put in conifers. These gravestones, these uh, rough boulders with the names of individual clans, went in in 1881 and that was fully 135 years after the battle. So we're fascinated to find out whether or not they actually are over the graves of dead clansmen, or are they just symbolic? Are they just somewhere for people to come and see a grave mound and a gravestone so that they can put down their wreaths? But this is a very sensitive site, and the last thing we want to do is disturb the graves of the dead. What we're going to use is a form of radar that gives us a picture of what's happening underground. And when we run that radar machine over the grave mounds, that will show us whether there's a grave pit underneath or whether they're just mounds over nothing, really. As well as the graves in the clan cemetery, we were also going to survey the so-called Field of the English. This is traditionally where the government dead are thought to be buried. But, in contrast to the clan cemetery, there are no headstones marking the government graves. We were hoping to find them. You move like a gazelle, Jerry. Okay, quite Through the veil. How's it looking? Um, Something coming up here. Okay. What? Just a suit, then. <laughs> 
We have a reflector. So just go ahead. Interesting. Go. So that come from under the slime? Squeak, squeak. So what have we got? It looks like we have some disturbance right here, between right. here and yeah. here. That's between the two paths. I mean, this is just the raw data we're looking at yeah. at the moment. After scanning the field of the English, the radar was then dispatched to the Clang Cemetery. I'd soon know whether there was a grave pit beneath the Cameron headstone. After Jerry and Lorna had processed the data from the radar, they began by showing us the results from the field of the English. OK. This is 100 metres from one end to the other. And this effectively gives you a slice through the earth with the ground surface up here. This, we we'll call them reflectors because it's radio waves going down into the ground and reflected back right. from whatever's there. And this here is the kind of subsoil, the base of the subsoil. You so essentially if you've, got, if you've got a straight line, that's fairly undisturbed. It's undisturbed. Yeah, it's undisturbed, yeah. and you can see it's undisturbed right down into the subsoil. Mm. But below that, we have a very, very interesting the cut feature. Lines. And if you can see your eyes drawn uh -huh. into this shape, almost like a large pit shape. You know, decent Christian burials are oriented the way that this trench is. Yeah, we can't see for yeah. certain this is it. I mean, mm. it's, it's it. But given the circumstances, <laughs> given that we cannot excavate in there, then to find what looks like evidence of a a pit that's 50, 60 metres long and maybe yeah. 8, 10 metres wide, in the absence of excavation to check it, it's, it might be as close as we're going to get. And in the Clan Cemetery, a radar result had shown that all of the supposed grave mounds did in fact have pits underneath them. This suggests that when the headstones were added 135 years after the battle, the original burial mounds must still have been visible. But the story isn't that straightforward because we found pits where there are no mounds and we found several pits under the old road. And that ties in with stories from the 1830s when the road was being built of human bones being found by workmen. And obviously the big temptation for us as archaeologists is to excavate here. But this place is a war memorial, it's a national shrine important to people all over the world and there's no way we would even think about disturbing the ground here. So in terms of finding out about my ancestors and where they are, I'll have to content myself with knowing that the Jacobite dead are in this area and the Camerons are amongst them. The Battle of Culloden marked the end of Bonnie Prince Charlie's rebellion and the start of a brutal suppression of the Highlands. Cumberland was responsible for both. He was fated and rewarded in London, but in the Highlands, he will always be despised. Do you reckon this tent's actually been in battle? Well, it must have been, Sex army. I'll tell you about the time my family, entire family lived in a tent. <laughs> Lived in it for two months. It was uh, five of you. It was me, my brothers, and my sister. All right. Four kids, and my mum and dad, while they were waiting for the house to be built in Oban. It's something this size. It was. It was like this. But you know those family ones that have little. They had little bedrooms. All oh, right. Hung down these yeah. canvas bedrooms. Have you been throwing things on my bed again? <laughs> well, look at it. It's a skip. <laughs>